Hudson County View, live and uncut. I'm your host, the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour, John R. Heinis. And as you can see, we're here with our new studio setup, and we have a lot of great latest and greatest news from Hudson County, as always. So first of all, the uh, main focal point of our program this week will be an interview with all three members of the Jersey City Board of Education Change for Children team. So that will be forthcoming just after our first commercial break. And on top of that, we want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in uh, Jersey City elsewhere on the municipal government level. We want to talk about that Civilian Complaint Review Board, what's going on with Ward E Councilman James Solomon and Ward A Councilwoman Denise Ridley. Obviously, that did not end up having a first reading on either measure last night, so we're going to tell you what happened at the council meeting and, of course, the caucus before that. On top of that, we're going to talk a little bit about the Hoboken City Council and their vote on their $117.8 million budget. While they voted it down just one week ago, now they came to an agreement that passed 8-1, which largely revolved around uh, how much surplus was going to be used out of the city's reserve. So we're going to give you all the details on that as well. And uh, if we have time, we're going to be talking about the Jersey City Quality of Life Task Force now being a part of the Municipal Department of Public Safety. As we've seen for many weeks now, there was a number of public speakers who were didn't want to see the Department of Public Safety get any more personnel. They were still talking about defunding the police and all that. But at the end of the day, this measure passed seven to two. So that's something else that is on our radar and we hope to have time to speak with you about. But first, we are going to have a word from our sponsors and then sit down with the Change for Children team. We'll be right back. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, Jersey City. Hudson County's only monument maker, serving all faiths and cemeteries. Design studio and launch inventory on site. Cemetery inscriptions and custom orders welcome. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, just south of Seacorkers Road. Craftsmanship that will last for all eternity. Burns Brothers, Jersey City, Albert H. Hopper, North Arlington. Visit us on the net. Consumer Carpets, 3408 Kennedy Boulevard in the Jersey City Heights, your one-stop store for residential and commercial floor treatments. Carpeting, linoleum, tiles, laminates, hardwood floors, area rugs, remnants, all major brands, all in stock. Free estimates, same-day installation. Consumer Carpets, it's savings, selection, installation. Credit cards and debit cards accepted. Financing available. Consumer Carpets, price to fit your budget, installation to fit your schedule. On the net at ConsumerCarpets.com. Consumer Carpets, Jersey City, 201-792-2712. Good Friends Self Storage in North Bergen, New Jersey is a fully climate controlled facility equipped with state of the art security, packing supplies, a refer friend program, and multiple loading docks convenient for commercial use. Located just off of Route 3 at 4301 Tunnelly Avenue, Route 1 and 9. Call 201 867 2444 or visit us on the web today. Good Friends Self Storage, let us be your good friend. Oh, now it looks really good. Hudson County View, live at Uncut, John R. Heides, and we are with one of the first-time candidates, Karen Poliski of the Change for Children team. Karen, thanks for coming in. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. So, nice to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you as well. So look, obviously the Jersey City Board of Education is uh, not for the faint of heart, I think it's fair to say. True. So what made you decide to want to step up to the plate and run this year, especially knowing what's been going on with the public health emergency? Well, especially because of the public health emergency, um, I decided to throw my hat in the ring. There's a bunch of reasons why I decided to, to do it, but mostly um, it was because of overwhelming frustration, you know, with the board. Uh, I'm um, a little bit about me. I'm a third generation Jersey Cityer. You know, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, and um, I'm a business owner. And as a business owner, I just can't see how they are running the board the way they do. You know, there's a couple of things you have to know when you're and you learn when you're running a business is that you have to anticipate what's going to happen and you have to make a plan and enact that plan. And I don't see any anticipation here and foresight and seeing into the future something, you know, to bring the, the kids and our education into the next level. You know, digital remote learning is not a new thing and we should have been on top of it before this pandemic, you know. so. Basically, for that reason, I feel like I could I could get it done, you know, and also the budget, you know, the, the, the way they're handling the budget, it's just wasteful spending and no transparency. And again, as a business owner, you cannot spend what you don't have, you know. So all those things for those two major reasons, plus the fact that we're in a deep hole with this pandemic and how are we going to pull out of it? I don't think we're going to pull out of it with this team. So we need new blood on that board to get ourselves out of this hole. There's a generation of kids that are out of school for seven months 
They had absolutely no plan and they've been left behind and it's going to have detrimental effect unless we have people in there that can make a plan and get it done. All right. So what would be your plan to get it done? <clears throat> well, we would start for one, you know, training teachers on how to you know, use remote learning. We would have to hire tutors. You know, we, you don't even have to break the bank to hire tutors and tutors right now that can work digitally. We need to track the children who are falling out, who are not even lined up for school right now, who are not digitally connected. We need to get laptops in their hands and connections in their homes. So we need to do that first and foremost. We need to tap the universities. We have great universities here that are training good teachers. We could have that be part of their curriculum to, to teach these kids, you know, remotely at least, and to double time, help them get back to, to grade level, you know? So we need to tap who we already have in, in Jersey, you know, to, to work with the kids. We have to train the teachers. We have to get the kids connected. Even that that little bit of minimal act, which it's a huge act, but even those those little three things can get us where we need to be, you know. there's We need a clear criteria for opening up the schools. We need to get back into school, you know, eventually, especially K through f fifth grade. They need in-person learning. As COVID yeah. preparedness goes, so your opponents have said that you guys did a good job of uh, throwing daggers, so to speak, but you didn't really present much of an alternative plan than what they've already done. So what would be your reaction to that? Well, what they've already done is, is to me, you know, you, you, first of all, I understand you can't see a pandemic coming, but you could have made some plans, like I mentioned before. Remote learning is not new. Other districts have been doing it for at least five, ten years. You know what I mean? So there was no pre-thought into, into getting our kids where they need to be as far as society is heading into the digital age. Education is changing. You know, there are new paradigms for learning. They, they don't research and stay on top of what you, what, what they need to. And if it was a business, it would be out of business because they're not staying on top of it and they're not looking to the future and not anticipating what could happen. So that, you know, basically, there's a bunch of other things they could have, should have, and would have done that, you know, we could sit here and list. But. So as far as fiscal responsibility goes, it's no secret that uh, state funding, municipal funding has not been kind to the Jersey City Board of Education, to put it right. mildly. Mm -hmm. So as far as that goes, as far as preparing the budget and as far as, you know, just basically getting the spending plan to a place it needs to be, what do you think needs to be done there? Well, we need transparency. You know, you need we need to see where this money is going. You know, we have a, a, a we have a huge budget. There's a huge shortfall. And we need to, first of all, understand where the money's being spent, how we can spend it better, and tie it to the strategic plan. There's no, there's n whatsoever, there's, there's no um, information out there that says, here's where the money's going for this initiative. Here's what we're doing for this. You know, there's mismanagement of funds, and, and God knows where the money's going, given the board's, you know, ethical history. Very good, Karen. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back with Sonia Centrone. So just stay with us for a moment here. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Jersey City Medical Center. You know it for its award-winning, life-saving ambulance service. It's also your health hub with health and wellness locations staffed with certified professionals all through Hudson County. The Jersey City Medical Center. Here to help you with your healthy, here when you need us the most. The Jersey City Medical Center. Visit us on the net to learn more. Jersey City Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas Health Facility. Let's be healthy together. Newport, the luxury waterfront community on the Hudson River, offers a quality of life you deserve in 10 high-rise rental towers with amenities such as the on-site Newport Path subway, light rail and ferry service, Newport Town Square, three playgrounds, dog run, upscale restaurants, Retail giants like Sears, JCPenney, Macy's, and Target. Morton Williams Supermarket is just outside your front door. A health and fitness club, spa, skating rink, and medical facilities are also on site. NewportNJ.com Enjoy the New York skyline from Newport Town Square. Manhattan is just one path stop away or quick ride through the Holland Tunnel. Nursery and private elementary schools all on site. 12 screen movie theater at the Newport Center Mall. Want to visit Newport? Stay at the Western or Marriott Hotel. Go to NewportNJ.com for details. Newport has luxurious towers, great restaurants, shopping, New York skyline views, schools, playgrounds, a marina and yacht club, gym, spa, fine wine, fine living. It's incredible. It's you. NewportNJ.com. Newport, live like you want. That's a Gaudi View live at Uncut, John R. Hydes. And once again, we are joined with the Change for Children team. And right now, I'm joined with Sonia Centro. So, Sonia, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yes. So, obviously, you ran last year, and you didn't get the result you had hoped for. Uh, you ran as an independent, of course, but now you're back running with a slate, obviously. So just tell me how that transition happened and why you thought this was the most logical step for you uh, as a candidate. 
Well, um, I can honestly say that the transition, I welcome it. Um, but uh, my concerns are and always been the children. Uh, we have had a, quite a, a, a turnaround. 2020 has been really impacting us with the pandemic and the lack of preparedness. Um, the reason why I'm running is because I know I can bring um, unique skills to the board. Um, I've worked in the classrooms. I've worked as in, in the financial services. I also um, am a substitute teacher. And at one point I was working here in, in our Jersey City district. And I know the challenges. I've seen the challenges for the teachers, you know, on a crisis mode, on a daily basis, the challenges and, and what's required for the children on a daily basis. Also, um, the community involvement. I know as a substitute teacher, we need to focus on the, the parents. We have to communicate with the parents, which is right now what's really frustrating the, the, the parents. Um, many of the parents are concerned with the COVID. Um, we're, one day we, we're falling behind um, promises about schools being opened and, and only to learn that we're closed and they're gonna open up next month. So the frustration is there. There's no real future planning. The goals is to, to try and at least um, provide that leadership and uh, try to, to, to be in a, in a more proactive mode rather than crisis to crisis. Um, so as far as COVID preparedness goes, Sonia, so the board, we've, we've heard that, but we've heard some other supporters say that they've done everything they could. They took multiple votes. They heard from the community. They've done virtual meetings and in-person meetings when it was still permissible. So what do you think is lacking in this current plan where now we're not going back to the classroom any sooner than November 16th? What's lacking is preparedness. I mean, we've had this COVID since March and it's already been um, noted. We have to follow the science. We have to secure the safety and the, and the staff, you know, their health of course is very important, but we could have been prepared like some five years ago. Um, uh, hybrid learning, online learning, however you want to call it, virtual learning, this has been in existence for some time now. So I think we need to, like, in, in, a, in a proactive mode, re remain doing the research and um, stick to, to, to moving and planning forward. And, and like I said, I, I've worked in the financial industries. I know we have a huge budget and shortfalls, we have no transparency, as my, my teammate has, has been mentioning, yep. and we need transparency. And I, I can bring that to the, to, to the Board of Education. As someone who's been in the classroom, what do you think is something that should be instrumental or perhaps a integral and part of getting back into the classroom when it's safe? Well, um, at, at, at this point, we need to understand that um, the science, the data, that's very important. With, without it, we can't just go ahead and just, you know, bring the staff in and the children in. It's very important that we follow the science. Okay. And as far as uh, being fiscally responsible, we talk about this budget. It's bigger than a municipal budget. And, you know, this year happened to have a fairly significant tax increase, which a lot of states and a lot of uh, municipalities and boards of education have had, of course, due to COVID. But uh, in this particular case, this is a lingering issue. The budget shortfalls are not new. What do you think needs to be done on that end? Well, again, we have to really make an assessment of what needs to be done. And I'm sure with the transparency and we have a little bit of clarity of what's going on, we, we you know, we, we just work with what we have. And hopefully from there, we can be able to attain the goals that are needed and, and, and prioritize as far as our children and our teachers are concerned. Sonia, thank you so much. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add before we let you go today? Yes, vote for Change for Children, four, five, and six. Thank you. <laughs> All right, very good, thank you. We're gonna hear another word from our sponsors and we'll be back with Ashidia Johnson. Pen and Pencil Properties, Jersey City. Shaping the workplace with state-of-the-art office spaces that address your company desires. Building residences that define your home environment adjacent to all modes of transportation with on-site parking available. The right address, the right lease. Call 201-521-9000 or visit online at panapintoproperties.com. Panapinto Properties, building Jersey City for everyone. Rama Jewelers, located in the Lyndhurst Shopping Center at 413 Valley Brook Avenue, Lyndhurst. Come for all your jeweler needs at Rama Jewelers, where you will find a fine selection of necklaces, earrings, rings, and bracelets. Choose from one of our complete sets, our many signature items, or find the perfect engagement ring. Come on down, that's Rama Jewelers at 413 Valley Brook Ave, Lindhurst, 
Call 201-939-5784 or visit us online today. That's it, Gaudi View, live at Uncut. I'm your host, John Arhidas, and joined with the third and final member of the Change for Children team, Ashidia Johnson. Ashidia, thanks for coming back in. Hey. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. So, obviously, you ran with this team last year. It was a different uh, makeup, but, you know, you're back again with the latest incarnation. Why did you think it was uh, important not only to run again, but to stick with the uh, Change for Children banner? Well, it was important for me to run again because clearly there's been a lack of leadership um, that ex has been especially prevalent this year with the pandemic. Um, it's obvious that there was no da disaster plan in place because they weren't prepared for what was going to happen even a little bit um, during talking to parents and talking to voters and, and talking to teachers that I know. There was a failure of communication with the teachers, failure of communication with the parents. People were confused as to what to do when, where to go for what. And um, overall, you know, the leadership is lacking. And in a time like this, you definitely need strong leadership. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. So from the time that the classrooms were closed, I believe that was the last week of March, the first week of April, uh, something like that. Till now, uh, through the summer months, really, what do you think should the plan have been? What do you think the structure, the communication and things like that from the Board of Education should have been for parents, educators, students? Well, something as simple as the public school's website, you know, to keep parents informed of what decisions are in the works, uh, what they're possibly planning on doing, a mechanism for the parents and the teachers to give their feedback. There was none of that. Um, and, and clearly throughout this pandemic, there hasn't been adequate research. They haven't been following what professionals are saying. We have neighboring districts right in Bergen County who are reopened already. Clearly, they've made a plan. And so even throughout the pandemic, once it started, there still hasn't been any leadership. It's like they've been absent. So would you say it's unacceptable that they've already called remote learning through November 16th? Or how would you characterize that? Well, you can't determine when you can send the kids back until you have a solid plan to reopen. You have to know that the buildings are 100% clean, not pretty good. Um, you have to have certain certifications in place. You have to have the proper safety precau precautions, um, gloves, masks, things of that nature. You need to know how often the building is going to be cleaned and when and how you're going to do that between moving the children and the staff in and out. And none of that has been present. And uh, in terms of fiscal management, you know, we're talking about the budget, which obviously passed a few months ago. Uh, you know, it was really a, a, quite a divide I saw. Like some people thought, you know, this is the best case scenario and other people thought you guys did do your jobs. I mean, I obviously know where you stand, but what would you have liked to see before that spending plan was approved by that board? Well, first of all, the input from both the parents and the teachers and to the taxpayers to have some transparency with them. If you're asking them to contribute more money, you should be able to show them what you've been spending money on, where there's a shortfall and what your plan is for that money going forward. OK, and we've seen your opponents, uh, I believe their most recent statement, they talked about billionaire developers helping your team. And this isn't the first time we heard it, right, as yeah. you may remember. And uh, last year was one of the most, actually, it was the most expensive board of ed race in New Jersey history. Certainly 2020, far different from 2019. So I guess just to clear the area, I mean, is the Ferrer NJ, the LaFrac, uh, organization? Are they helping your team at all this time around? Um, we do have comp contributions from uh, various people and companies, and um, I don't think that that's a bad thing. And people who know me know that my relationship with the community, whether it be the small business owner or the huge developer, is the same. I do what's right by the community. So I think that they use that as a distraction from the fact that there's been a lack of leadership on their behalf. All right. And obviously, needless to tell you again, you're running against three incumbents. So why do you think they have not done their due diligence as board members and it's time for a change. I mean, you're still getting the same thing. You're getting no transparency with the budget. You're getting uh, no transparency with the, commu the community. Failure to communicate during this pandemic. Failure to have any disaster plan in place. No, you can't predict the pandemic, but you know that we have storms, you know, floods. Anything can happen that could shut down the school. And for you not to have a plan in place, that proves that you're, you're failing in your leadership and it's time for something new. The parents and children deserve better. So they've said that they've sent out email blasts, you know, they advertise every caucus and every regular session, special meeting, so on. And they're in contact with the parents and staff regularly, and they're not hearing a voluminous number of complaints. Uh, of course, I'm putting this all to one condensed ball, I guess, but what mm -hmm. would you say to that? 
I would say um, the proof is in the pudding. And, you know, when I'm out in the community and I'm talking to parents and teachers, that's not what I hear. I hear parents that are confused, parents that don't understand what the plan is for reopening, parents that are not clear on how the schools are going to be safe and whether they're, they've been completely cleaned already. I hear teachers who are upset that they weren't properly trained and given um, all of the resources that they needed to be able to teach remote learning. Um, I hear things about kids having to switch between different apps for their lessons that they don't understand and their parents don't understand. So I don't know, you know, what small group they're getting their information from, but the group at large is saying that they're dissatisfied. Very good, Ashidia. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank Chief you. Children, thanks for coming in. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. We're going to take another commercial break. We'll be right back. Most women who give birth recover without problems, but any woman can have complications after the birth of a baby. Learn the post-birth warning signs, such as fever, headache, chest pain, shortness of breath, increased bleeding, or thoughts of hurting yourself or someone else. Knowing these can save your life or the life of someone that you love. Trust your instincts. If you feel something is wrong, call and get evaluated by your healthcare provider. If your symptoms get worse or you do not hear back from your physician, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. It has actually changed my life. You know, it's wonderful to be in recovery. I'm also a grandpa, a great grandpa. I found joy in being abstinent from use. You know, I'm a family member. I'm a productive member of society. Um, I'm a dog owner, things like that. I'm a fiance. So I think that recovery means on such a broad scale, there's so many different layers to what recovery means to me. We're just like everyone else, we have heart and soul. Um, it's just that we've, we have the substance abuse disorder and that we're dealing with that. And if anything, it makes us a little bit stronger. The most important thing for people in the community needs to know is that they're just like anyone else and that they don't necessarily want to be doing the things that they're doing and it's a chronic illness and it's a chronic disease that needs to be addressed as so. You know those times when you need to see the doctor but you just can't get to the doctor? So where do you go? Go to the App Store, download the Telemed app from RWJ Barnabas Health and you see the doctor right away from any mobile device, whenever you want, wherever you are. Quality care, no appointment necessary. The doctor is online when you download the Telemed app. Don't you feel better already? RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. For our listed in, in Councilman Solomon as, as members or um, of, of the, the commission from which they would be drawn from, that they are anti-police. Um, I would challenge to say which groups are anti-police there because, and I think that gets to the heart of actually what's going on here, right? The, the idea that there's a perception that a group like the NAACP, the ACLU, um, that Jersey City Anti-Violence, that other groups that are simply seeking for, for fairness and justice and, and the treatment of, uh, uh, of black and brown communities that have been at the hands of, um, and none, none can deny it, that... Uh, um, it, it's on, been on display for us now for, for months um, here, and, in, um, and all of us have been home, locked in our homes, watching TV on it, um, that we have seen the, the, the sort of systemic uh, um, discrimination and uh, mistreatment of, of black, particularly black men um, and black women, and, Leah and uh, Brianna uh, Taylor, that uh, we see, uh, among others, um, that have... Uh, suffered at the hands of police. Now that's not Jersey City. To deny and say otherwise, to suggest that the, the culture of an organization um, and of, of a country um, is somehow, uh, that somehow Jersey City is exempt from that um, is, is, is simply putting our heads in the sand on that, I would say. And so um, I, I would challenge that these organizations are in fact not anti-police, they're pro-community um, and they're pro um, social justice, and I think um, uh, the, the very perception that they are at that police is at the crux of like what the real problem and the challenge that we have in trying to trying to address the, the systemic issues that are um, that are afflicting our communities today.
Yeah, Rolando, I'm talking basically about the ACLU. I'm going back over the last 40 years and yeah. all the police incidences. So, uh, you know, once again, I, police I, have I, to I would never say the ACLU is anti-police. Once uh, you should have listened to the police radio Saturday night. The cops in the city couldn't even handle all the calls. And, you know, this funding and all this has got to stop. Because we're hurting the people of the city here. That's at Gaudi View Live at Edgar, Chad Arhaitis. And that was from the Jersey City caucus meeting on Monday afternoon. You saw Ward C. Councilman Rich Paggiano and Councilman at Large Rolando Lavaro going at it about the Civilian Complaint Review Board that may be coming to Jersey City sooner than later. However, we've just recently pumped the brakes on that. So at that caucus, we saw the drafts spoken about at length, the one from Ward E. Councilman James Solomon and Ward A. Councilwoman Denise Ridley. Now, they agreed on a number of things. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of differences in the beginning. You know, they both want subpoena power for these boards. They both want to see uh, disciplinary power. They want to see budget protections and a trigger mechanism. And what that means is when Trenton, I guess if Trenton, but everyone expects it to happen ultimately, does make an amendment where civilian complaint review boards can have subpoena power, that this board in Jersey City will be ready to go on that same day. So with that, the big difference on the, in all this is that Councilwoman Ridley's board would have nine members, Councilman Solomon's board would have 11 members, and Councilman Solomon would allow seven community organizations to pick the board members, and that those organizations include the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition Movement, Jersey City NAACP, and the ACLU uh, chapter, uh, New Jersey chapter of the ACLU, excuse me. And as far as Councilwoman Ridley, the other thing about that is going to be that the mayor would have the ability to appoint the chair and vice chair of the board. Councilman Solomon wanted the board to do that appointment. However, according to Councilwoman Ridley, that's exactly what the state bill, which is currently awaiting a, a vote and uh, has been introduced by Assemblywoman McKnight, says. So with that, they ended up pulling it, and uh, the Councilwoman Ridley had some choice words for Councilman Solomon, but uh, I'll have to ask for you to either to go back to the tape or read that one as we're running short of time, and I want to jump to Hoboken for a moment before we call it a week. So they actually had their budget vote last night. You guys probably recall that last week they voted on whether or not they wanted to approve a budget with a 9.8% municipal tax increase, and it was $117.8 million, and it would ultimately have a 1.4% net change for the taxpayer. That means including the county, including the open space tax. Well, that was voted down 6-3. This time, we had an amendment introduced that would allow the council to consider 7.5% municipal tax increase and an overall tax increase of 0.75, which is just $70 annual increase for the average resident in the Mile Square City. Well, in typical Hoboken fashion, they managed to make two resolutions last over an hour. There was quite a bit of back and forth. We saw First Ward Councilman Mike DeFusco, Councilwoman at Large Emily Jabour really went at it. We heard some uh, impassioned speeches from the Third Ward Councilman Mike Russo, the Second Ward Councilwoman Tiffany Fisher, and just about everyone had their voice heard. When it was all said and done, the amendment passed 9-0, and the actual budget itself, which is still a $117.8 million spending plan, passed 8-1, and Councilman Russo was the only one to vote against it. So it looks like any uh, shenanigans, if you will, for the budget will be saved for next year, but we will have the mayoral race and the three at-large council seats up for grabs. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to call it a week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.